Alpha Charlie Papa, 45 Alpha Charlie Papa channel viewers. This is the old gunsmith with you one more time. We want to take you back in history a little bit and talk about uh, some uh, historic pistols, some rubies, which are still around. Uh, this kind of all starts out in 1914 in France in World War I. So let's take a look at these pistols and see what we have. Um, the Spanish Ruby pistols, most of the military ones and police ones were in 32 ACP. During World War I, France could simply not produce enough handguns to arm their army. So they contracted with the Spanish maker of Gabliano for 10,000 pistols a month and trying to increase their availability of pistols that they could arm their soldiers with. Uh, later, as the war went on, the, uh, they increased the number of pistols they needed to 30,000 a month, and then later to 50,000 pistols a month. Unfortunately, Gabliando uh, was unable to produce anything like that quantity, so they subcontracted with four other manufacturers whose names I will not even try and pronounce uh, to produce pistols for them. And as the demand increased, Gabriano went back and added three more manufacturers. So now you've got seven manufacturers in Spain pushing these pistols out. Uh, France was desperate, just absolutely desperate. And when this was inadequate, uh, what they were getting out of Spain, even at uh, the, the, as many as seven manufacturers could produce, it still wasn't enough. So France itself went out and contracted with another 45 different companies to make what has been collectively called the Ruby Pistol. No matter how they're marked, they are known as the Ruby Pistol. Uh, some of the things you will see on them is they normally have this straight style of grip and these C cuts in the back for grasping and uh, charging the pistol. So those are, are kind of on mo almost all of them, although you see a, a variation here. Some had uh, hammers internally, some had uh, stri were striker fired, others had external hammers as we can see on this particular model right here. There's an external hammer on that one. So we now have over 50 companies producing these things as fast as they can produce them and France just saying more, we need more, just send us more. Um, so you can imagine with all of that going on, quality control and part interchangeability from over 50 manufacturers simply doesn't, didn't exist. And France was desperate enough not to worry about it. Now, the soldier in the trench paid for that lack of consistency many times when he discovered that even the magazines were not interchangeable. All the pistols look similar, but there are many internal differences. As you can imagine, when you have pistols that were everything from striker fired to external hammer, even though they look the same and they're called ruby no matter how they're marked, they can vary all over with uh, internal parts, dimensions. Uh, the only thing they really had in common was they sort of looked alike and they all fire the 32 ACP for the military pistol. We can open a couple of these up just, just to take a look inside and see if we can find any differences in these. Uh, I think I'm uh, <laughs> unfortunately I was opening the wrong side there. This is they generally will have a safety here, European style safety that when it says F that means it, it can fire, and it says S that means it's unsafe. And we'll generally have the European style magazine release underneath. The uh, 1911 Colt was the, the thing that changed all of that and made it uh, much more uh, uh, easy or much easier to eject magazines by simply pressing a button rather than playing with that thing on the bottom. Here's one. Yeah, let's see if we can get another one going here. These two look quite similar, and we'll probably use these two without going too much into the third one, but we can. It won't really matter, but and once again. Okay. 
Okay, you also, if you can see this, let's out of the way. If you can see this right off, we can tell this particular gun has a trigger extension that pushes on a pivoting piece. The sear is notched into the top, and as we push the trigger back, it rocks that forward, pulls the sear forward to disengage it. In this one, we have the trigger bow coming back and directly contacting the sear, and as the trigger is pulled, it just pushes the sear back. And you can see this ingenious method of keeping it uh, from flopping around <laughs> and, and riding up. But in just in these two pistols alone, side by side, you can see the difference where this one, the sear is got a pin here holding it in, and it pivots on that. On this one, the sear has a pin here holding it in, and we have a transfer bar, basically. And uh, this pistol, although I haven't taken it apart, has a uh, magazine um, safety to where when if the magazine's not in, it won't fire. These do not. So just to kind of highlight the fact that there's almost nothing about these pistols that, that is consistent. Uh, they are just from different manufacturers. They have different markings on them, yet they're all known as rubies. This one is actually a unique, and we have uh, one here that's uh, just marked with the manufacturer, and this one here was marked as uh, Liberty. So those are three different pistols. All of them go by the name Ruby, and all of them are a little different. I mean, you can imagine what that meant to the guy in the field whose gun all of a sudden went out of uh, uh, working condition. He was basically better look for another gun with a magazine in it. <laughs> the only thing that was common is all the ammunition should fit in the same uh, guns. Uh, as the war dragged on, and France became more desperate, the procurement process really went totally out of control. And there was absolutely no quality of control of any type. Many of the pistols were made of improper materials with poor or no heat treatment. And of course that caused them to wear out in some cases in just a few hundred rounds, if they worked at all. Many were brought home by doughboys, and they were imported by the thousands after the war. Here they received a deserved reputation for poor quality and substandard fit and finish and reliability, but consumers that just wanted a cheap pocket pistol bought them along with other manufacturers that saw a market for inexpensive handguns and met the demand and the man was finally filled with a lot of diff different cheap pistols and revolvers. And to, to highlight that, let me come up to this particular revolver here that was brought in and assembled uh, here in this country. Uh, this is what became later known as the Saturday Night Special. Although all of these were known as the Saturday Night Special because they were cheap. Uh, this was, was kept cheap. As a matter of fact, this particular one I bought brand new in San Antonio, Texas, back in about 1968, for uh, $20. Bought a brand new pistol, 22 pistol, for $20. Uh, and that was because I was in the Air Force at the time and I couldn't come up with the $50 a guy wanted for a used 1911. Can you imagine a $50 1911 and I got this instead because I couldn't drag up the 50 bucks. Uh, I managed to shoot this one totally out of time in probably 500 rounds. And to this day, the only thing I use it for is I was using it for training dogs. Single action is still will shoot uh, blanks. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't dare put a 22 long rifle through it. But once again, pot metal, cheaply made. And it filled a uh, uh, niche in the market that uh, was open for people who just didn't want to spend more than 20 bucks for a brand new gun. So that went around till about 1968. And in 1968, in the wake of the Kennedy assassination, uh, the moniker Saturday Night Special was applied to any inexpensive handgun. Part of the Gun Control Act of 1968 made further importation of many of these guns illegal. 
However, many of them are still around, and they are an interesting part of history. So why don't you, we let go out? Why don't we go out and shoot a couple of them, and see what you can expect if you run across them and and decide you'd like to buy this a uh, piece of the little piece of this history, and just to see what they were experiencing in the trenches of 1914 through 1917. Okay, the World War One French Ruby. Nice. Quality gun. Thank you, 1968. Gun band. It is a functional pistol. <laughs> Can't hit it, <laughs> but it functions. Can't find the broad side of a barn, but it does work. <clears throat> if you were a French officer and the Germans were coming, how would you feel? <laughs> I think I would drop my firearms and run. <laughs> I give up. Well, that's what the French are known for. <laughs> no wonder. <laughs> All right, what I've got here is the little French uh, unique uh, 765 or 7.65. It is the 32 ACP. Uh, this is a the police gun for the French. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, see how well it runs. Nine rounds, single stack. It's got a really funky release and safety on it. All right, we're hot. Oh, come on. Oh, That was interesting. Very interesting little pistol. Very unique. Here's okay, it's a World War I ruby. Uh, this one says Liberty on the side. Uh, 32 ACP. Have no idea if this will run or not. We'll find out here in a second. <laughs> That's not a good sign. <laughs> it's hitting but I'm certainly not uh, hitting any plates <laughs> and there it is there it is the, the enemy is officially scared yeah <laughs> it's officially scared the enemy but it functions it operates it uh, is shooting way to the right finally hit that last plate because I aimed way over to the left. Well, we're back from the range and uh, we've shot the, a couple of these pistols. Uh, we've uh, experienced uh, what the, it was like and what kind of reliability we could expect out of these just as we have them without doing any work to them. So since I have shot these before and I knew what to expect, I didn't shoot them very much, but we had our boss over here, uh, the head of 45 Alpha Charlie Papa Channel, Dreisaman M, uh, who had never shot them before, come out and he did most of the shooting on these. And you'll see that in the clips when uh, uh, we showed you the shooting that he was doing most of the shooting. And what we wanna do now is have him come out and give us his perspective of what he experienced with them and what he thought of them. So Dreisam a &M, let's get you in here and tell us what you found. Well, thank you, old gunsmith. Um, 
It, it was an interesting experience, uh, to, to say the least. Um, this one I actually hit a couple plates with. Seemed to it may have been a little bit more accurate, but I started having issues with it. Um, uh, something catching, you know, that was cocking the hammer, but I was having to fully cock the hammer to get it to shoot the next round. It was locking up after every after every shot. Became basically became almost like a single shot revolver. Um, yeah, I hit a couple plates with it. Uh, it it was fun shooting, but a little frustrating too, and it's probably a lot more accurate than I was shooting because I was dealing with uh, the issues that it was giving me. Um, the other one we shot was this one here. Now, it had some problem getting it loaded, but once we, we chambered the first round, uh, we ran through the magazine with no issues. Um, it did fire and function, but I have absolutely no idea where it was hitting. Um, you know, 10 yards trying to hit a six inch plate and not didn't hit one. So very, uh, very inconsistent with uh, how it was shooting. Um, you have to put it on paper sometime, maybe see if it's a little bit more consistent, see if uh, we can find you know, where where it's aiming at. But uh, you know, a very unique piece of history, I guess. Um, you could see where you know, the French uh, officers and stuff, uh, you know, may have issues not wanting to pull their pistol. Um, you know, the French officers, you know, scaring the Germans. I don't want to scare, I want to kill the Germans. I don't want to scare the Germans. <laughs> And, uh, you know, these would be uh, really good to scare them and, and really make the Germans mad. So, you know, very interesting pistol, very unique uh, perspective of history. Uh, I know some of these are, are good, and a lot of these are very inexpensive, made very quickly, and, you know, just are not the greatest uh, firearm in the world. So, uh, tell me something. If uh, you were a French officer, and this is what they handed you, how, uh, how would you feel facing the Germans coming over the top of the trenches and through the barbed wire? Uh, scared. <laughs> <laughs> now you know why uh, in the old uh, Superman things, after they f emptied the gun, they threw it at him. <laughs> because you couldn't hit him anyway. <laughs> Maybe this is where the uh, uh, tradition of the friends dropping their guns it and could, running away came from. It, it could be. You know, this one, you know, we, we put one shot down through it. Um, this one's had some work done to it. Um, it's not always cocking every time. In fact, you know, it's not cocking right now. So, you know, this one has, has some issues uh, with it. So we didn't really take this one out to shoot. Um, had it with us. And it's, it's just part of the example of what you can find. All right. So what do you, what would you say to... The people watching this, as far as a recommendation uh, of buying one of these pistols, you know, if, I mean, if, they're, they're, they're available for a couple hundred bucks. They're not yeah. expensive. I realize that uh, you, know, you may get a functioning gun. You may not get a functioning gun. You may get a gun that, that wears out really quick. You know, if you're into history, into having you know, something that, that was there, into you know, ha you know, just having a gun, you know, maybe as a wall hanger. Hey, you know, that's a... World War One Ruby from the French, um, you know that that's great. But if you're looking for something for concealed carry or something like that, I would completely stay away from them. Uh, they're just a fun little range toy to go out and plank with. Um, even though they are military weapons, I wouldn't uh, give them to my military. I think if you're a World War One collector, they have some um, value. Uh, and I think also that if you're a uh, burgeoning gunsmith looking for something. To work on and to learn how it works uh, and to just give you the um, experience of looking at a pistol like this and seeing whether or not you can get it to work there's some value in that but i have to agree with you i wouldn't buy one for a concealed carry gun no. <laughs> where i might have to actually rely on it there they'd be a fun little range plinker and that's about the extent of it all right well no the video is not quite over yet um we got this home uh, I wanted to kind of you know, pull it apart and kind of give you an idea of the construction and, and something that happened. Um, went out and fired this gun. Everything functioned uh, and worked. Um, it was not very accurate. It was shooting off. Uh, I'll show you that here in a minute. But uh, got it home to clean it. You know, something to expect from these pistols. Um, like I said, they were, they were made fast. They were made cheap. Uh, let's go ahead and take this apart.
drop the magazine. Pull the slide off. There we go. First thing, when I finally got it apart, you notice in there, the firing pin broke. I had a piece of firing pin fall out uh, as I as I took it apart. So, uh, like the gunsmith said, these are you know great guns if you're looking to learn how to gunsmith on. Um, figure out what's going on figure out how to make pieces that uh, they're not making anymore I mean, you know true gunsmith can you know build and, and make the pieces he needs um, He's not just something somebody who's just swapping parts So we've got to make a firing pin for that and that will be a different video um, You can you can kind of get an idea there. You know the machining marks and stuff that are in there um, something else that I saw that I found yeah, safety just kind of flops in and out of there, but you have to have that safety in order for it to work uh, If you look here on the hammer you can see How mushroomed out it is um, You know that hammer is not made of very very strong steel uh, Strong enough to push the firing pin, but you can see how it's mushroomed out and peened out over the years so just another thing to show you, you know, how inexpensive and, and these these pistols were made. You know, they were being made fast and produced as, as fast as possible. Another thing I found on the pistol, um, if you can see here, that spring has overrode the little cap here that, uh, that captures it. So, and one of the reasons is, if you kind of look in there, kind of hard to see, but it's just full of gunk in there so that spring finally up and overrode it and you can see it's been this way for quite a while so that's something else i plan on trying to work on it and fix on this get that this cap cleaned out get this spring back captured in here where it belongs but just thought i'd uh you know take this apart kind of show you you know the the rough work the rough mill workmanship um as to uh you know on these pistols i mean they were just built fast one of the other things, so the reason why it was shooting so off is if you look here, there we go, we'll get the, the sight in there so you can see that rear sight, not even close to center on the top of that slide. It is shifted way to the left, uh, which would be, re be the reason why um, he, you know, he was having to weigh, aim way left in order to hit anything so made very quickly very uh, interesting little pistols but you know, as you can see you know that that rear sight is not even close just an interesting piece of history fun little range plinkers but that's what they're going to be they're going to be wall hangers range plink plinkers um, you know something if you wanted to learn a little gunsmithing on you know want to make some parts or something You know if something wears out um, Something that's going to be a great educational tool for you. So this is 45 level Charlie Papa and I'm signing out Thanks for watching please subscribe